morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy 2021. And we are so grateful for each of you who have joined us. This is the Berkshire High Peaks Festival Reunion brought to you by Close Encounters with Music. My name is Carolyn Regula, and I will be hosting today and for future events. All of our sessions are being recorded and will be live streamed on our YouTube channel as well. Even after all of our classes and master classes, lectures, even after they're done, you can go back and watch them again on our YouTube channel. So Close Encounters with Music, the mission is to engage the imagination of diverse concert audiences in a welcoming setting to connect listeners to performers and composers, foster the excitement and sense of community that live performance arts builds, and to establish a comfortable listening environment, turning performances into enriching and educational experiences. Now for our presentations, you can use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen in your Zoom toolbar to talk amongst yourselves. If you have a question for our presenter today, you can use the Q&A feature that is also found at the bottom of your screen. I will be monitoring these windows and will be relaying your questions to our presenter. I will also be including some links in the chat if you would like to learn more about High Peaks and to visit our YouTube channel. Now to welcome you all, it is an honor to introduce Close Encounters with Music Artistic Director and renowned cellist Yehuda Hanani. Thank you, Carolyn, and good morning, everybody. Greetings to High Peaks participants, past, present, future, friends, music lovers everywhere. The COVID crisis has brought us all together worldwide with shared concerns, challenges, and uncertainties. And we thought that rather than wait until festival time next summer, we should have a winter reunion and boost everyone's morale, learn how you are coping, and keep your enthusiasm and passion for music alive and hot. We have four exciting events every day for the next three days. Please join us for as many as you can. My dear student, Carolyn, will be hosting the event and will introduce our first speaker for today. I look forward to being with you at five when we discuss interpretation. Welcome all. Thank you so much, Mr. Hanani. For our first guest, we have Dr. Arnold Cohen, who will be giving a talk on practicing the word prodigy. And he has a very unique perspective on the concept that will get you all thinking this morning. I really think it's really going to jog your minds make you see our musical world with a new lens and give a big welcome to Dr. Arnold Cohen. Well, <laughs> thank you and happy new year and hi to everybody. Um, you know, a few months ago, Yehuda asked if I'd be willing to give a talk at the winter reunion of the High Peak Festival. Uh, he said perhaps something about the COVID pandemic and how to deal with the emotional stress and difficulties that everybody was experiencing. And I said, of course, because supposedly I'm supposed to know something about that. Uh, but I quickly realized that by this time, we've heard enough about the crisis and how to cope and what to do and how difficult times are. So I thought I'd try to think of something more positive to speak about than that um, and something about that and its connection to music. So I asked my granddaughter, a violinist, and one of her performing partners, if they could think of anything good that's come out of this crisis. 
And she gave me the emphatic and obvious answer, absolutely not. Uh, but I pushed and pushed, and finally they acknowledged that at the very least, that being at home and stuck at home, uh, that they had plenty more time to practice. And so I began to think about the importance of practice um, and began to think about the question about inborn talent and the other factors that went into making a virtuoso performer. Uh, Matthew Shermer, a columnist for Scientific American, wrote a piece three years ago does success come mostly from talent, hard work, or luck? He posited, first of all, that talent was important. And you'll see through this conversation that we're about to have in my lecture uh, that I question whether that's actually true or not. Um, but talent, hard work, or luck. And he opined that actually luck was the most important of the three. Luck, first of all, being born, luck being born into a family that can be supportive, luck uh, coming, let's say, for example, from an upper middle class family here in America, or unfortunately, a below caste family in India or in war torn Syria. Uh, the luck of living in and having caring, nurturing, encouraging parents the luck of having a good education and the luck of having excellent teachers to guide them along and also the luck to be born in the right time of history you know malcolm gladwell in his book the outliers explores this issue in this particular issue in detail he reminds us that bill gates steve jobs larry page Sergey Brin of Google are all examples of people who are exactly the same age and all of whom are highly successful in the world of technology. Um, Bill Gates and George Allen, his uh, partner, uh, were born to well-off families. They were lucky to go to a progressive private school. They were even more fortunate that that school decided to make computers part of the curriculum long before computers were common in school. They were lucky to live in Washington state where the university had a mainstream computer that was being used by the faculty during the day. And although still on at night was being unused. And so uh, Gates and, and, and George Allen would steal out of their homes every night and they spent the entire night perfecting their skills as a computer programmers and became incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, another example of the kind of luck comes from the outliers, the example of the, Be of the Beatles. The Beatles uh, were a typical boy band in Liverpool, um, but it came at a time when a owner of a club in a red light district in Germany was looking to find ways of getting more customers into his club than others and heard about the boy bands of England and thought it'd be a good idea to hire one to play, to have all of the music streamed out into the street and maybe encourage people to come in to his club. So off he went to London where the boy bands were and explicably he got off in Liverpool, discovered the Beatles, who he then hired to play all day long, every day for an entire year and to keep their sanity what they did is they played together, um, trying to improve, trying to create new ideas and to improve their uh, play with each other so that by the time Ed Sullivan was ready uh, to bring a band to this country to his TV program, the Beatles were there and ready for it. What's common to these stories, of course, is luck, but also importantly to practice hard work not necessarily to talent, but to work and, 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 and experience. Um, before I begin to explore the evidence about hard work as being the most important of the issues, um, I, I just like to go back quickly to a talk that I gave at a High Peaks Festival a few years ago. Um, I reported on a study that was done by the National Institute of, Mental, of, National Institute of Health where they had a large cohort of kids whose family allowed them to have um, brain scans, 
and neuropsychological testing done during their infants, during their early childhood, growing up in mid childhood and in adulthood. Uh, that was to get a normative sample. These were kids who were perceived of as normal, the average, ordinary kids across the country. And what was interesting is that somebody having all of this data thought to ask a question, are the kids that play musical instruments any different than the kids that did not? And the answer was, yes, they were. There were anatomical changes that were seeable. Kids who were performing, who were playing, and studying um, had demonstrably increased maturation, quickened rather, uh, maturation of gray air, uh, of the gray matter of, of their cortex, and correlating with that, advances in, uh, advances um, in their neuropsychological functioning, things like processing time, focus, and attention, and uh, working memory, and things of that sort, um, and. What is also what was also interesting, and, and by the way, and confirmed in other studies, um, that it's not that these kids were smarter so much because of IQ, but all of these advantages led to improved performance in non-musical areas. So that these kids who did all of this musical playing uh, and study uh, did better in math and in language studies, etc. Um, correlated with that, by the way. Uh, we know in other studies too, um, that in kids who play instruments starting before the age of seven, that you can see a change in brain structure. Uh, the corpus callosum, that thing in the brain that communicates, the highway that communicates between the left and the right hemisphere uh, is larger uh, and, and, and anatomically more visible um, in kids who began practicing before age seven. Um, although I, I must admit, and I think I should say this clearly, that there's no evidence that one has to start playing before age seven to be a good musician. It's just that you don't see the anatomical tracing of that in, in the same way. Um, I think it's important to say again that there were these advances in executive functions, these things that we call processing speed, et cetera. Uh, not that the kids were more intelligent, but that they got to a, uh, a, a, a level more quickly than did their peers. What I think is important in coming back to the subject of today is that the earlier the start and the greater amount of practice, predictably, the better or the higher the outcome. There are plenty, of course, as I say, um, there are performers that started long after the age of seven. So I, please don't, don't take that as a necessary uh, component to all of this. But nevertheless, clearly, cons uh, consistent practice uh, is, is, is clearly important. Um, and anyway, look, if practice is good for the brain, it's obviously good for the development of music performance skills. Um, in fact, uh, we will hear um, that it is possible to consider that maybe um, it is more important than what we consider talent, and that maybe talent is a detriment, and a decrement, and we'll talk about that too. Um, in his book, Bounce, Matthew Saeed, an English author, and by the way, table tennis champion, um, says that there is no such thing as prodigy, period. Uh, what differentiates prodigies from others really has more to do with family, family structure, and early training. Um, in 1991, a psychologist by the name of Anders Ericsson and his two colleagues did a fascinating study. He looked at three groups of violin students at the Music Academy of West Berlin. And with the help of the faculty, they divided the students into three groups. The first group, considered destined to be stars, to be great soloists. The second group, likely to have good, solid careers. Um, and the third group, um, not so much. And um, anyway, the first group at that time were, were considered uh, to be super talented and lucky to have been born with special musical genes. 
Anyway, using detailed interviews and questionnaires, what the researchers found was rather remarkable. By the age of 20, the best violinist group had averaged over 10,000 hours of practice during their lifetime. That was 2,000 hours more than the middle group of good, competent instrumentalists and 6,000 hours more than the ordinary players. There were no other variables that they were able to find that separated the groups. Purposeful practice was the only distinguishing factor that separated the groups. The only difference, as they report, and I quote, was a lifelong persistence of deliberate effort to improve performance. And interesting, I remember seeing a documentary movie uh, about uh, Yitzhak Perlman. And in the movie, he says, uh, and these aren't quotes, but he says that if he did not have had polio when he was a child, he would never become the violinist that he was, that he is. Um, that if he had been healthy, he would have been out on the streets playing with his friends. But because he couldn't, he stayed home and he practiced. Now, I understand that practice alone is not enough and there are other important factors, motivation, teaching, belief in self all come to mind. But what about talent? You know, it's hard to measure but there's not much to say about it. At least I can't find too much that supports it. Um, and I'll come back to that. Um, but I will say this, that the 10,000 hours, of course, is not just about music. It's about sports and about business. In fact, it's even more demonstrable um, in sport and in business than it is in, in music. Um, you know, the, Jim Bowden is a famous pitcher for the New York Yankees, retired to the Berkshires where I got to know him. Um, and um, I, I asked him about his, how he developed, in fact, he wrote a book called Four, uh, uh, <laughs> um, a very famous book called Four, um, and uh, in it, you know, you, 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 he, he speaks ongoingly about the intensity uh, of his practice, something which, by the way, continued um, way into his 70s. I would, we would go and visit at his house and behind his house, he had built a wall, and on the wall, he had built a, bat, a representation of a strike zone. And every day, he would continue to go out and practice his knuckleball. Um, and when he was a kid, rather than joining a league or doing these kinds of things as a small child, he just remembers every single day going out in the morning, playing ball until he had to come home and unless there was school. And then finally, of course, joining uh, leagues in the high school team and the American Legion team where he was finally given a good, a good instruction, et cetera. Um, and uh, the history then is there. Now, I will admit, Jim's hand put up against mine was twice as big. I doubt that I could have thrown a knuckleball. So here we can talk about the, maybe the equivalent of what we'll call talent. Uh, but there may have been other things that I might have been able to do with the baseball uh, if I had pursued in the same way that he did. But I didn't. Um, practice, by the way, is not about the endless repetition of what we know. Matthew Saeed relates in his book, The Bounce, that most adults have practiced driving for well over 100, uh, 10,000 hours. But it doesn't make us great drivers. It makes us good enough drivers. We practice to a level that we feel is important and necessary to be able to get around the corner, to be able to make left turn, right turn, and drive through traffic. Put any of us out there in the Indy 500, and the likelihood is that we would get killed. Informed practice means constantly challenging oneself to improve and to master and to move forward. Um, it needs, it, it's not only about motivation, this also about good and informed teaching, teaching. And here, I think we come to something else which is incredibly important. Teaching has to be at a level that allows for and insists on improvement. Teachers who can break things down into the element, see to it that the student is, develops a sense of mastery and then can be able to put the pieces together to develop increasingly complex ability. Yasha Heifetz famously said, and I quote, the discipline of practice every day is essential. When I skip a day, 
I notice a difference in my playing. After two days, the critics notice, and after three days, so does the audience. Heifetz, by the way, began get taking violin lessons at the age of three. Back to talent. Talent may actually lead to a decrease in ability. It is a hindrance. It's disempowering, says Saeed. And I think he makes a good case for that. Um, he does make a case, though, and I get, again, I, I, I promise to get back to that, uh, that it's not prodigy uh, that made, um, not prodigy, not talent that made Mozart the great, great a musician, a composer, the great composer that he is. Uh, but it's all of these other things that we've mentioned. Mozart's father, Leopold, as we all know, uh, was a performer and even more importantly, a noted pedagogue and the author of the definitive book on violin instruction, which he, by the way, published the year that Mozart was born. And uh, music was in the air all the time. Mozart was given a violin and instruction and informed instruction very early on in life. Um, and um, in, in Michael Howe's book, Genius Explained, he estimates that Mozart played, likely played an extraordinary 3,500 hours before he was six years old. Um, and although he and although Mozart produced competent composition, produced composition uh, compositions as a child, uh, remember they were mostly rearrangements of the music of others, and he likely achieved his 10,000 hours only by mid adolescence and his greatest masterpieces only after the age of 20. This history, by the way, is similar to those that we think of in the world of sports. Tiger Woods, we think of, we think of the Williams sisters and tenants. Again, it had to do with the families that they lived in, the early instruction um, and the quality of that instruction and the intensity of that instruction that ultimately led to their, um, to their fame. Said says, and I quote, child prodigies do not have unusual genes. They have unusual upbringings. They've compressed thousands of hours of practice into small periods of time between birth and adolescence. And that's why they become world class. Talent can actually rob people of the incentive. Um, and I will explain that now. Um, Carol Dweck, a psychologist at Stanford, studied a group of 330 fifth and sixth grade students. And she gave them a questionnaire that was able to uh, separate and probe their beliefs in things like talents and, or, or, and innate ability and innate intelligence uh, from that group of kids who believed that anything was possible. The first group, those that believed that intelligence was ability and is gold, he, she called the inborn excellence group, fixed mindset, she called them, fixed mindset group. The other group that believed that effort could improve ability, she called growth mindset group. In an experiment, both groups of kids were given a set of problems. The first group of problems were really very easy and the last group very, very difficult. The fixed mind group gave up early on the last four problems. They believed that they had reached the limit of their ability. They began to doubt themselves they began to think in the beginning, wow, how easy, I'm really smart. But then when they hit the harder stuff, they figured, ah, I've reached my level of ability. And they blamed their lack of further intelligence and ability, um, and therefore they then stopped. Um, the growth mindset group, on the other hand, more than 80% of them maintained and improved the quality of their strategies during the difficult problems. And actually, some of them actually solved problems that were way in advance of those that they theoretically should have been able to solve. Simply put, the children who believe that the abilities are transformable, not only perceived, but improved with effort, persevered rather, and improved with effort. Those who believed in their innate ability regressed into a state of what uh, the authors called psychological enfeeblement. 
And these studies, by the way, have been done on college students. They've been done in, in, in groups here in this country and in Asia. And it keeps coming back to that same um, issue. The group that believe in the possibility of change as the transformative thing do better than that group that believe that they are simply uh, a product of what it is that has been given them in the, in the way of talent. Um, Saeed, going back to this, um, relates an example of an Olympic skater, skater a woman who decided to achieve a, a, a do a, a trick uh, that no woman had ever been able to perform. She tried thousands of times before succeeding. And each time she tried, she fell until finally she had success. And when asked about what happened and how she dealt with the failures that had preceded all of that, she was dumbfounded. She never considered them failures. She considered them as opportunities to learn something new. Huh. Here's something else from Yasha Hybis. There's no such thing as perfection. There are only standards. And after you set a standard, you learn that it was not high enough. You want to surpass it. He also said, there is no top. There are always further heights to reach. Obviously, one has to be highly motivated to do the 10,000 hours of practice, to be forced by parents only because it pleases them leads to disaster. And I've certainly seen that in my practice of psychiatry, and we read about it in some of the papers and the journals, that it is only if the child's interest in pursuing the passion um, that they are going to be successful. Otherwise, it becomes a disaster in the family. Um, and so clearly, again, this is what I think that uh, Saeed was talking about. There's something about the way these families of people who are these high achievers present these um, things that, of course, kids couldn't come to themselves unless the parents presented to them, like music. That is the attitude, the supportive nature of it, the encouragement, the participation in it, and all of those things that lead the parents to encouraging kids to continue to pursue. Um, and develop both the external and internal reward that mastery feeds the motivation. Or I should say that their motivation feeds the mastery. Um, there may be some biological attributes that may permit this more easily in others. But I, again, uh, think that, that the evidence is stronger for um, the perseverance based on desire. Again, I know we talked before about Jim Bowden's hand, and I know there's stories about the numbers of hours that Shaquille O'Neal practiced basketball. And I guess had he been five foot five instead of seven feet, he probably wouldn't be the star that he is. Still, uh, it's interesting, you know, um, it's, it's said that uh, Asian people, people who speak Asian languages um, uh, have, are more likely to have perfect pitch than people who, who speak European languages. And you know, is, is that a biological attribute or is it simply that Asian languages are pitch dependent and children by virtue of need and experience from the very earliest days are attuned to differences in pitch. So here we have it. Um, again, uh, practice is informed by good teaching, good teaching and belief in oneself. Certainly the importance of belief in oneself come together along with the motivation and the desire, the experience that is required. Um, now I realize I haven't talked about creativity and expressive expressivity, uh, two essential features in, in, in the in upgrade artists, but I believe that the hours of practice sear into the brain and into one's memory, all of the techniques and technological information, as well as probably other things that are required uh, that one doesn't need to think about anymore that become automatic and don't have to be considered while 
in, involved in the act itself. So therefore, the freedom to be able to concentrate on the moment and in the meaning of the moment become much more easily uh, doable. Again, from the world of sport, Aaron Judge does not think at all about what goes into the perfect swing when he's standing at bat, nor does the pitcher consider and think about all of the things that go into the perfect pitch. They only think about the moment and what they're going to do. They rely on their working memory for all of the rest of what, no, they work on their memory uh, and uh, entrusted it uh, so that all of those pieces fit together and the working memory, only those things that they need to pay attention to so that they can complete the task so that he can, the judge can hit his home run and that the um, violinist or cellist or whomever uh, can play at the level that they want. Um, Saeed tells an interesting story, although it's not about a musician. I think, again, it comes back to, and I think it says in a kind of an interesting way, uh, what all of this is about. So there was this guy, his name was Laszlo Polgar. Laszlo Polgar was an educational psychologist living in Hungary. Um, and this goes back, I think, into the 80s. Um, and he believed that children had extraordinary potential and all that was needed was for it to be unlocked. He uh, believed, again, that informed practicing and and uh, uh, informed in form teaching and informed practice, informed in form teaching and, and long, long practice were the essentials. So he began to correspond with a bunch of women. I gather this was pretty common back then in Hungary. If you wanted to meet a woman, you, you would start writing letters to her and write contacts, bunch of uh, pen pals. Anyway, he began a correspondence with a woman named Carl, uh, Clara who lived in the Ukraine. Um, and um, she became uh, entranced by him, by him, his theories and his ideas and him as a person. And lo and behold, they got married and she agreed to participate in his grand experiment. Um, he was a hobbyist chess player. His wife didn't know how to play the game, but he chose chess as the thing to spend his energies on. So his wife, Clara, gave birth to three, three daughters. The first, the eldest being Susan. Susan, he decided, was going to become a chess champion. Um, and she was homeschooled. He interestingly would start playing, he, he made chess something that was in the surround and he brought out the chess pieces as things to play with, like you might play with dolls, or you might play with you know, soldiers or whatever. Um, and so that the kids, that she would become very comfortable with it. And he began teaching her the rules of chess, began to read himself, began to understand what needed to be taught. And over time, by the time she was five, um, she was now busy playing and um, she accumulated hundreds of hours of practice. She was enrolled in tournament after tournament, all with great success. And then came the second daughter, Sophia. She also had the same early experience with chess play and chess pieces, and this time with professional coaching. He encouraged her to play with the pieces, take serious lessons, began to practice and practice unendingly. Uh, and then came Judith. Judith arrived even a few years after that. And again, the repeat of the experiment. All three daughters had achieved their 10,000 hours by adolescence. Susan won her first world championship at age 12. Uh, the championship was about girls, world championship of girls under the age of 16. In 1991, she became the first woman grandmaster. In 1986, she qualified for the world championship, was barred because she was a woman. Sophia, again, numerous championships, gold medals. Her greatest achievement was what in the chess world was called the miracle in Rome, in which she played eight straight games against the world's leading men and won them all. 
She has been ranked just below Bobby Fischer, Kofarov, Kasparov, etc., as the fifth greatest chess player in the world. Judith, the third daughter, again, exposed to the same early loving and intense chess experience, at 15 became the youngest ever grandmaster, male or female. She is the number one female chess player in the world and is considered to be the greatest female chess champion of all time. Now, were they prodigies? Because if we read the stories about them in the newspapers or in, in books about them, they're all considered prodigies. But are they really prodigies? Or were they simply highly experienced, learned early, highly motivated, driven, uh, to perfection or to close to it, coming to close to perfection uh, with the support of her family? Um, I think it's a good question. Anyway, that's pretty much all I've got to say about this. Uh, I think I'd like to close, though, with two quotes from Yasha Heibitz. Some more from Yasha Heibitz. I think they make the point. He said, there is no top. There are always further heights to reach. And then finally, and maybe this probably is something else that we're talking about, but perhaps maybe uh, another time. He said, practice like it means everything in the world to you. Perform it like you don't give a damn. And we thank you. That's all I've got to say about that. And I'm happy to entertain questions because I see there are a whole bunch of them. Um, yes. Yes, we have had a lot of submissions over the course of your talk. And I want to encourage people, you can still submit questions if you would like in the Q&A feature. So... So I, I have a whole bunch of questions from Howard Lieberman. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I, I will acknowledge, you know, first of all, one, you know, I got into doing this because I think one, um, <laughs> you had asked me to talk about some of the mental health aspects of, uh, uh, of, of, of these times. You know, I, I am not a, 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 a highly knowledgeable or experienced expert in the field of, uh, of prodigy. Um, but from what I gather, um, you know, um, in the first question, Howard Lieberman asks, uh, what about people who play more than one instrument? Um, and uh, there are people that do. And I, I, I think that one can learn more from everything. Uh, does 10,000 hours of performing translate into practice? I think the answer is yes. But I also think it's about paying attention to what each and every time that you're doing in your performance is different and better. And not again going back to the idea of the um, um, uh, driving uh, ten thousand hours. You know, if you're only going to interestingly just want to achieve ten thousand hours of, of driving and, and and get to where you're going fine, and if you're going to perform and don't have the uh, desire to try to find something new and eager to try to present it in a way. Uh, that's new and different. I think that you're doing what you would be doing if you were just an ordinary driver. So I think that no, performance not is is part of the 10 hours and that 10,000 hours. But I also think it's part of the 10,000 hours only if you're doing what we're suggesting that needs to be done um, in those 10,000 hours of performed practice. Um, Now, there's a whole long question, and I'm trying to read it here as I. Uh, um... Yes, um, this was from Mark Cannon, who is also um, actually giving a talk late right. as a part of our reunion. And I believe the gist of his remarks are the number of hours any given person practiced was strongly correlated to how much talent they had. That's true. This was a question that, ab yeah. about well, the, the 20. So, now, so we're going around in a circle, and I understand that. Um, to say that they have talent, um, again, if you take the position 
that what creates what we look, what we perceive as talent as experience um, and, um, and, and practice. Uh, again, going back to the study of the violinist, and again, I wasn't there and I'm only reporting the, 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 the study. The study suggests that even as they looked at all the variables about these uh, young violinists in the conservatory, now they were all in conservatory, I recognize that, but the only differentiating feature between the good and the best was the number of hours of work that they put in to achieving it. Um, so I, 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 again, I think that we have to be careful how we and what it is that we're asking about when we ask about talent. Um, you know, is there something biological that's built into the brain that puts people at an advantage? Uh, you know, th th this is a, a very difficult um, thing to, ex to, to, and again, this is not my area of expertise. I do remember a book uh, written many, many, many years ago, uh, having a psychoanalyst um, uh, about the inherit the, about uh, the neurotic distortion of the creative process, um, suggesting that there are all kinds of variables having to do with one's historical, you know, the psychological historical history that go into uh, being allowed, allowing oneself to be creative. Um, but again, you know, whether this is about a hardwired thing or an acquired thing, you know, I, I, we will go around. That's right, Lawrence Kuby, right, that was the book. Yeah. And that actually segues nicely into our next question. Um, some book recommendations on this topic. Well, I, I think that again, it's a pop psych book, and I don't usually go. People who ask me to do, you know, what to read in the literature, but I think it's a place to start. First of all, it's fun to read. Um, it's this book that I've got right here. Um, it's called Bounce. Um, it's by Matthew Said, and I'll read the full title: Mozart, Federer, Picasso, Beckman, and the Science of Success. Bounce. And I think that you'll see a good deal of what I have talked about comes from that book. And the other popular book that really talks about some of these issues uh, is, Ma is uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, The Outliers. He talks about the various things that go into and historically what, it, what differentiates people who have achieved greatness in a variety of ways, what separates them from everything else the outline. So I think that's a great place to, that's a kind of a fun place to start. Yeah. Excellent. And we have a question. Everyone talks about the number of hours, but not the quality of these hours. I did. I mentioned that. I, I Maybe I didn't enforce it enough. The hours cannot be simply, and this goes back to the first question, it's not about the repetition of what you know. It's about taking what you know and taking it one step further. And I think it goes to the quote that I offered by uh, Yasha Heifetz, uh, again, speaking to that same issue that you've got to build upon what you know and that the great teachers uh, and, and the students that achieve uh, a, a, as a consequence of their exposure are those people who take what they know and add to it something new. Again, this young woman that did her 10,000 falls before she learned her trick uh, each and every time she thought she had learned something new. So practice is not doing what you know. You know, if you, if you learn one piece of music, and <laughs> we, one of my grandson's friends um, was visiting over the summer. They'd all been tested, and they came to join us for a while safely. Uh, and the kid played for at least every day. Um, you know, it doesn't make him a great musician, and it doesn't improve his playing. Uh, so, yeah, it's not just about practice, it's how you practice. Great. Uh, we have a question actually from Mr. Hanani. He wanted to ask, uh, he's referring to your story about the, the chess, the family that played chess. Chess is a computer-like skill, yeah. mathematical manipulation, calculations. Computers can win a game Computers can't write a symphony. And the question is still out there. Actually, that the question is out there, and I understand that. I, I, I'm offering this, but I do understand that there are things that are not known. However, I'm, and I'm not knowledgeable, and I'm just 
being drawn into this field of artificial life, which is something which is an a, a outgrowth of um, in artificial intelligence. Computers are now learning how to think new thoughts, not only about what has been in, put into them, but to use what in, has been put into them to learn new things. And so it's not only that computers know everything about chess, because they don't. Uh, the number of possibilities of what is possible in a chessboard goes into the trillions, and it's an extraordinary number of possibilities. But it's knowing something new and knowing something about what you think the other person is going to be doing. And again, you know, I, so I, 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 it may be, like it or not, uh, that we will be hearing computer symphonies that will sound pretty good. I don't know, but it's very likely some, you know, this whole new world of computers. And if you want to read about that, <laughs> there is a book, and I cannot recall the name of the author, even though I've just read it. I've been trying to put it out of my mind because it's so difficult. A book simply called Complexity. Um, it's, in, it's available in paperback, and it talks about this new science of complexity, mostly centered at the Santa Fe Institute of great thinkers, great across across disciplines, by the way. Um, I believe this is the book, um, Emerging Science at the Edge of Order and Chaos. There it is. <laughs> yes, that's it. And it's not it's not an easy book, but go for it. And I believe we have kind of one more question and something I'm personally also curious about your idea or opinion about if certain people have something in their genes that might make them more predisposed to an instrument. I, I, I think so. You know, I, I, um, I, I know, for example, I, I talked about in, in this talk some a couple of years ago about this thing called uh, executive functions and the executive functions let me just go, so, sort of kind of just sort of talk to that for a second because executive functions are all the very different kind of things that our brain is doing um, uh, that lead to our being able to act and deal and do in the world to read to write to play to create to do whatever uh, there are so many different we just call them the executive functions um, and you know one way to think about what the executive functions are, they, they, all of these different things are going on in the brain, and there has to be a central place that organizes, there has to be a central thing, that a, a, a thing that, not a central, but a thing that organizes them. And the analogy, by the way, to an orchestra comes to mind. Like you take 80 of the greatest musicians in the world, and you put them in a room, and you say, play Brahms' Fourth Symphony, and it's probably going to sound terrible. Um, somebody's got to organize them. Somebody's got to put it together. So there are people who have some issues with, uh, and you do neuropsych testing, and I see them in my office, people with some executive function difficulties. Um, and what we know is that we can work on improving them to a degree, and we can improve upon them to some people a lot. So if we're now talking, and I, again, I'm getting very vague, uh, you might say, that there are people whose executive function skills are well within the range of norm. And those who are not, there's probably a spectrum. And so it's likely that in complex activities like music, music performance, production, uh, that an intact or close to intact uh, executive function skills puts you at an advantage and maybe more likely to want to pursue things than for somebody who has to work a bit harder. But again, the hard work should get you there. Fantastic. I believe that was our question. Um, Dr. Cohen, did you have any final closing remarks you would like to make? Um, yeah, well, look, you know, I, I, I know I can't answer the question about creativity and of, um, and I know that the issue about uh, talent is unanswered, but I do think that it's worth continuing to make the case 
um, that the harder one works at something, the more likely it is that the outcome is going to be is going to be good, and that there are across across domains across in the, in the arts and in the world uh, that this number ten thousand hours actually seems to be a real thing. I mean, I think it gets extended into other areas where it's probably not like taking ten thousand steps a day is going to keep you alive forever. It won't. Um, but there is that number, and, and, and looking at, again, uh, not just in music, but in all kinds of other areas of, uh, of, of um, possible expertise, it, it's, it's a real thing. So, yeah, it should, I think it needs to be taken seriously. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. And thank you all so much for joining us and this is our first event of the new year's bash that we have for the high peaks festival and if you are interested in checking out the rest of our events i just put a link in the chat and that will give you a list and links where you can register later on today 2 p.m. These are all in Eastern Standard Time. We have Crystal Manich, who will be giving a talk on virtual performance. So that's going to be a behind the scenes into some of the performances she's recorded and produced as a director. And then later on at 5 p.m., we have The Art of Interpretation with Yehuda Hanani talking about performance art, addressing the wonder of classical music and how it is kept alive through every age. And then at 8 p.m., we have a piano masterclass with Alexander Starkman of the Peabody Conservatory and also High Peaks Piano faculty. Thank you all so much. We hope you have a great rest of your day and that we see you for some more of our events as a part of the High Peaks reunion. I'm done, right? I just had a better answer to Mark Cannon. It's too late. I just realized there was an answer to him. We can bring on really quick, Dr. Cohen. <laughs> Because <laughs> Mark Hannon says if he was better, he would, if he had more talent, he would have continued to play more. That's exactly the point of the book, that people that believe that stop. People that don't believe that don't stop. I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you. you guys okay, you're welcome. behind the scenes extra answer. <laughs> okay. Fabulous. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Such You're a welcome. You're welcome. You. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>